Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. Special greetings to teachers and students who are participating in this event, especially to my students in NRM 221. You are participating in one of the 125 events held across the planet, which is part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. This event is in partnership with the Center for Environmental Policy of Bard College in New York. So in the next seven days, there will be similar events that will be held across the globe, organized by different universities and organizations with the intent of engaging everyone, especially teachers and students in a critical dialogue about climate solutions. My name is Joanne Serrano. I'm an associate professor of the Faculty of Management and Development Studies of UPOU, and currently the director of the UPOU Office of Public Affairs and Office of Gender Concerns, and I will be your host today. To give us a background about the project, um, Solve Climate by 2030, here is Dr. Iban Goodstein, the lead organizer for this project. Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. You're participating in one of 125 events held across the planet, including in almost all 50 US states, part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. My name is Eben Goodstein, and I'm an economist and director of the Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College in New York, the lead organizer for Solve Climate. This last year has been difficult for everyone. As the world looks forward to recovery from COVID, we are focusing tonight on the most important question facing humanity. What can we do in this year in our regions to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced widespread loss of life, economic disaster, and joblessness? Worldwide, from Australia to Kyrgyzstan, from Colombia to Malaysia, and from South Carolina to South Africa, Solve Climate audiences are hearing from local experts and young leaders about concrete steps that can really help nations solve climate change while creating much needed jobs and incomes for everybody. The year 2020 was one of the two hottest years in human history, bringing with it massive forest and grassland fires, record-breaking storms and hurricanes, and relentless rising seas. Solving climate is the challenge which the human species must now face. There's hope for the future. Solutions have continued to advance. This year, China committed to building a carbon neutral economy while the US rejoined the Paris Agreement. Solar, wind, and battery prices continue to fall while major car companies have been rushing to electrify the global fleet. Worldwide, movements for Black Lives Matter and Me Too are leading in bringing much delayed and urgently needed justice. To the world. Time is short. We have until 2030, 10 years to solve climate. We can get a lot done in this decade. We have the solutions, but only if we focus the world on climate solutions and justice, and then do the work we have to do in our own cities and regions. For students listening, you are the leaders. Without you, the future we envision will not come. I'm asking tonight for your help. We're gonna discover powerful ideas for climate solutions and climate justice and how you can be a part of the solution. But this message must reach beyond those of us who are listening right now. Would you ask all your teachers this week in every subject to make climate a class? The teacher can assign tonight's webinars homework for the students and then afterwards have a one class period discussion. And we mean every subject from art to engineering, psychology to business, dance to chemistry. Teachers don't need to be a climate expert to lead a discussion about climate change. The Solve Climate Project has easy to use teacher's guides in nearly every subject and in three languages to help teachers make climate relevant to their class. It only takes courage. Don't take no for an answer. Ask them why not. This is your future. You'll be surprised how many teachers will say yes and thank you. Imagine you. Thousands of leaders like you around the world asking their teachers once every school term to make climate a class. That means every term going forwards, hundreds of thousands, millions of students worldwide in their classes talking about climate solutions. COVID has shown how fragile our global economy and society are to extreme events. 
It's also shown that vulnerable people are facing the hardest, most damaging impacts. This is also true with climate change. Science has made it clear that unchecked, global warming will mean an unending onslaught of extreme events, causing untold suffering for humanity and all creatures, species driven to extinction, a planet of environmental refugees. And yet, in many ways, this is the most exciting time to ever be alive as a human. We have the tools and networks and technologies to rewire the world with clean energy, reimagine the global food system, reinvent transportation, and regenerate forests and grasslands, and be well on our way to solving climate by 2030. Tonight, we will learn how to do this in our own cities, our own towns, our own regions. Thank you for the work you will do to promote climate solutions and a just world. Thank you, Dr. Goodstein. Through this webinar organized by the UPOU entitled Climate Solutions, the Philippine Context, we hope to be able to contribute to the climate solutions through the sharing of our resource speakers for today. Now to formally open this program, let us listen to the opening remarks from Dr. Janet Naval, Director of the UP System Padayon, the public service arm of the University of the Philippine System. Good day, everyone. I am pleased to have been invited to share with you an opening message for the Solve Climate 2030 webinar on Climate Solutions, the Philippine Context. In the midst of this global pandemic, I thought for a while that the global concern on climate change has been sidelined, if not totally forgotten. I myself has been part of this cause and environmental justice and ethics has been my personal and academic advocacy since this is at the core of my research interest in the field of applied philosophy. And I welcome the Solve Climate by 2030 Global Dialogue on Climate Solutions organized by the Center for Environmental Policy at Bard College, together with the UP Open University and more than 100 universities and schools from around 50 countries, because it brings back once again the issue of climate change within the radar of pressing global concerns. Of course, I believe that the call to stop and the call for solutions on the impact of climate change did not cease. Maybe it was just temporarily uh, halted, clouded by the global health emergency that countries all over the globe have to address. In one story that I usually share with my students in environmental ethics, a girl asks her grandma after hearing about the story of the grim future that awaits if we don't put our acts together in this fight against climate change, she asked, why did people let things get so bad? And the grandma's eyes filled with tears as she took the child in her arms answered, well, because we didn't want to believe anything bad could happen with a problem whose effects we would not see until 50 years later. It is now 50 years later since the, since the 70s when the first international call was made. Of course, long before the World Meteorological Organization began to express concerns that human activities might lead to serious warming of the lower atmosphere, Rachel Carson in her work Silent Spring, Aldo Leopold's Land Ethics, Jan Passmore's Man's Responsibility for Nature, and several others in the field of environmental ethics have already shouted out. It's not a choice between human concerns and environmental concerns, not a choice between the pandemic and the climate change concerns. But from where I am coming from, ethics, the pandemic, and climate change poses an interesting convergence in developing a sustainable COVID response measure while at the same time addressing the problems or issues of climate change. I haven't done that paper yet. Although I have tackled animal ethics and food ethics in the time of COVID in my recent attempt to understand these intersections. I am excited to hear from our speakers climate solutions in our own context. 
and it looks like we need not really go very far to make our contribution in this equally pressing global concern through our interest in the arts, permaculture, by being plantitos and plantitas of native trees, and by simply recognizing what is indigenous in us. So again, the UP Padayan Public Service Office Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs congratulates UP Open University in this engagement to join the global campaign to solve climate change by 2030, an academic endeavor that is at the same time service not only to the university and the discipline, but public service to the world and all of humanity. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadal, for that enlightening message. Indeed, this is not the choice between the global health public crisis and climate change. We can do our part in helping address both issues. Now, um, just a few house rules. Uh, as you listen to the speakers, you may post your questions via the UPOU Network's chat room, or if you're watching uh, via YouTube, uh, you can post your comment in the comment box. Or if you're watching via Facebook, you can post your questions uh, via the comment box. Now, these questions will be collated and will be addressed by the speakers after everyone has presented. I would like also to announce that there will be an evaluation form at the end of the webinar and a QR code or link to the evaluation form will be posted at the end of the program. Now, please note that the evaluation form will be available only for six hours after the webinar. In order for you to receive an e-certificate, you are required to accomplish the evaluation form. Okay, I know that you are now very excited to listen to our speaker. So let me turn over the virtual floor to our moderator uh, for, this, uh, uh, for today's webinar, Dr. Consuelo Habito. Dokoni? Good day to everyone and happy Easter to all. Please call me Doc Connie. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. I am currently the program chair of the Master of Environment and Natural Resources Management of the UP Open University, the host university for today's webinar. As a digital migrant, when I want to learn more about a topic, I would Google it. One YouTube channel describes 100 solutions to address climate change. Another talks about 10 things you can do to reduce climate change. And one channel by an atmospheric scientist by the name of Catherine Hayhoe suggests one important solution. Talk about it. Today, we will talk about it. With nine years to go before 2030, the call to arms to address climate change requires individual and collective action. In today's webinar, we will hear four different ways by which we can solve climate change impacts. To keep you glued on the talk of our four invited guests, I would like you to see if what each speaker is talking about is an individual or a collective action or solution. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our first speaker. Ralph is a visual artist designer educator, and woodworker. He is the founder and director of the Prod its art projects focus on the environment and strengthening community resilience. Ralph also works as a learning experience designer for the Habi Education Lab and is a fellow of the Japan Foundation's HANDS project. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Mr. Ralph Daniel Lumbres. Good morning. I'm here to present a case for art. How can artists help with the climate crisis? One of the leading experts in sustainability and systems analysis, Don Alamedo said, Paradigms are the sources of systems. From them, from the shared social agreements about the nature of reality, come system goals and information flows, feedbacks, stocks, flows, and everything else about systems. I think it just means that paradigms, mindsets, worldviews, and beliefs 
are driving forces of systems. If you cannot change it, it is very difficult to um, bring forth system change. So then, what are effective ways to bring forth mindset change? Here's another quote from an expert on climate change communication, Anthony Lesarovitz. The arts are one of the most profound cultural innovations we have to communicate with our experiential processing systems. Art can connect with our analytical brain, but it is particularly great at connecting with the more intuitive parts of ourselves and is one of the most effective ways of engaging us emotionally. So I would argue that the arts is a powerful way to change the mindset of people, to convince, to communicate, and lead to behavior change. Here are just a few historical examples. Um, we all know that in the Renaissance art is one of the catalysts for changing the mindset of a more religious um, medieval period to a more humanist um, mindset of Renaissance Europe. In the Philippines, the novels of Jose Rizal sparked a revolution against the Spanish Empire. And uh, one of the more recent uh, examples, this documentary film, An Inconvenient Truth, uh, gave us facts about climate change, but also connected with us emotionally in telling us... Good morning. I'm here to present a case for art. How can artists help with the climate crisis? One of the leading experts in sustainability and systems analysis, Don Alamedo, said, Paradigms are the sources of systems. From them, from the shared social agreements about the nature of reality, come system goals and information flows, feedbacks, stocks, flows, and everything else about systems. I think it just means that paradigms, mindsets, worldviews, and beliefs are driving forces of systems. If you cannot change it, it is very difficult to um, bring forth system change. So then, what are effective ways to bring forth mindset change? Here's another quote from an expert on climate change communication, Anthony Lesarovitz. The arts are one of the most profound cultural innovations we have to communicate with our experiential processing systems. Art can connect with our analytical brain, but it is particularly great at connecting with the more intuitive parts of ourselves and is one of the most effective ways of engaging us emotionally. So I would argue that the arts is a powerful way to change the mindset of people, to convince to communicate and lead to behavior change. Here are just a few historical examples. Um, we all know that in the Renaissance art is one of the catalysts for changing the mindset of a more religious um, medieval period to a more humanist um, mindset of Renaissance Europe. In the Philippines, the novels of Jose Rizal sparked a revolution against the Spanish Empire. And uh, one of the more recent uh, examples, this documentary film, An Inconvenient Truth, uh, gave us facts about climate change, but also connected with us emotionally in telling us that we need to do something about this problem. But aside from these big um, examples, a lot of artists are already actually taking action against climate change. So art is already contributing to this uh, movement. Uh, I'm Ralph Lumbres. I consider myself an interdisciplinary artist. I'm interested in the interconnections of art in our life and uh, the world we live in. <laughs> I know that this might be very general, but I'd like to walk you through my journey and uh, the experiences that I have to narrow it down and maybe exp explain what I mean about this and how I integrated my art practice into this field of environment education and um, communication. So I grew up in Bukidnon in the countryside, playing with nature in the hills, the rivers, in the woods or forests. 
And I would say that this shaped me a lot and my practice today. My knowledge of art back then is very limited, um, but at the same time, it is not bound by uh, the conventions that we have today about art, by institutions, by galleries, by museums, uh, theaters, etc. Um, and then uh, I went to high school in uh, Philippine High School for the Arts in Los Baños, Laguna, in Mount Makiling, also in the mountains. Um, so this is a government scholarship, it's a boarding school, and here I, I had a more idealist view of art and that uh, art should be connected with society and is uh, important for nation building. There was a bit of uh, learning and unlearning when I went to university. Uh, here I was exposed to the art market systems and there was a sense that this is the predominant way of practicing as an artist or at least making a living out of it. But I still knew that I don't want to take that route of becoming a full-time uh, studio-based artist, um, doing exhibitions and selling artworks exclusively. So um, in 2016, I joined a fellowship program by the Japan Foundation Asia Center, where they gather people from diverse backgrounds in Asia to learn about disaster risk reduction or DRR uh, environmental education with the goal to bring uh, bringing in creativity to this field so you had artists designers educators researchers community development workers and etc here i realized that uh, interdisciplinary collaboration was possible and um, uh, i knew more ways to for artists to participate in drr and envir environmental education so in 2017, as an action plan for this HANDS project fellowship, I created LIGTASPAD or Light-Based Participatory 3-Dimensional Mapping. Participatory 3D mapping already exists as a practice, but I wanted to improve it and create alternative methods. This project was also funded by um, Toklas Innovation Labs, and I also collaborated with geographers from Philippine Geographical Society. So one way was um, one way to improve upon this mapping practice was to create an alter uh, alternative material to styrofoam and paper mache that they use. So I used sawdust and plywood here. And um, sawdust sculpture is a sculptural technique I learned uh, in art school. So it is light based because I used light projections to project data onto the map, to make it interactive, and also to declutter several data visualizations in the map. I also use the interactivity of light projections to gamify the learning process of the 3D map. The use of light projections was informed by my practice also in shadow play or shadow puppetry. So aside from this, we also used uh, gamification in the facilitated discussions and uh, workshops of this project. So when I did this project, I collaborated uh, with friends, with my wife and other Hans fellows. And with them, I f also founded uh, an interdisciplinary collective. We called it Projects Artist Community. For this collective, we're interested in creating art-based participatory projects in communities that is focused on the environment. Our next project is uh, ARC project or ARC or Art for Resilient Communities. So we implemented this in Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand, and again was funded by Japan Foundation Asia Center. So the idea of the project is to merge three similar community art-based projects from three hands project fellows action plans. So aside from the 3D mapping, we also did participatory photography or photo voice. So this is the research component and this informed us in getting the data for the mapping and also for the performances created for the participatory music and instrument building workshops. So the instruments created in this project came from recycled materials. So here's another example of how art-based activities can become useful in education and research. So since I use sawdust sculpture in making the 3D maps, I also use it as a primer activity so asking the community to create sculptures of their local biodiversity. This one is in Suluan Island in Eastern Samar. 
It's a very small um, one barangay island community in the east, which is the first uh, island hit by uh, Typhoon Haiyan. So here we also used uh, 3D map, the 3D map to illustrate uh, plastic waste management through a facilitated community discussion. Um, because it's tactile and visual or, and it's also spatial, uh, I felt that the use of the 3D map here and you know using some trash were very effective in engaging the community members emotionally. So here's the framework we also created for ARC project. Um, basically integ integrating art and community development with integrated risk management. So IRM, as it's also called, is a holistic framework integrating disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, and natural resources management. And in 2020, last year, I joined a research residency program co-organized by UP Open University, University of Plymouth, Cognova Foundation, SEEDS, and uh, other organizations. Collaboratoire is a research residency or research fellowship for cognitive innovation and sustainable development. So we started with a conference that was actually held in UPOU in Los Baños, as you can see in that uh, beautiful photo. Um, then we went to Shargao for a week for the research residency that was actually just right before the lockdown. Um, so we were quite lucky. We were grouped uh, according to our interests and I was grouped with the environmental empathy group. The program was very interdisciplinary. We were working with various methodologies, research in the arts, in technology, etc. And the idea is to come up with a research project um, I was working with practitioners in philosophy, geography, anthropology, communication, and among other backgrounds. Uh, so for this ongoing research project, we came up with the term ecological embodied cognition. The term, the term embodied cognition uh, is the idea that we think not just with our brain, but also with our body. Uh, and extended embodied cognition expands this to the notion that we think uh, also with the tools, with materials, with the space around us. So for us, we're looking at how environment and other living beings is also part of this thinking process, this cognition. And that's why we called it ecological embodied cognition or EEC. So we're curious as to how activities based in this principle of EEC can enhance environmental empathy. And again, this is an ongoing project. So if you want to follow us, you can go to echoembodiment.net. So just a few key points uh, before I end. Um, climate change is one of our greatest challenges. And I think for us to overcome it, we need uh, collaboration from different perspectives, from diverse uh, backgrounds, I think. And also for artists to realize that there are many ways to participate in this movement. And now more than ever, the term artist or, or being an artist is being expanded. And there are new ways now more than ever to how to become an artist, how to practice art. On the other hand, I want to challenge institutions, uh, organizations, um, the, and even the academe to create more space for interdisciplinary collaborations, to find more ways for artists and other creatives to participate in your projects. Which doesn't always mean to hire new artists, designers, etc. But even simply even to bring forth the artists within you in your workplace and inject creativity in your projects. Um, thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. And if you'd like to know more about me or access online links and references for this presentation, please go to uh, this link, uh, bit.loi slash artsolveclimate. So thank you very much. And again. Thanks, Ralph, on your very interesting talk on art and how it should be used as a vehicle for nation building and for communicating change. Ralph has used the intuitive nature of art 
to connect to people in an emotional way. He has used art methods for participatory 3D mapping through his Ligtas Pad. He has organized an art collective projects artist community for projects directed at community resiliency and the environment. His involvement in the Art for Resilient Communities, or ARC, has developed an art framework that operates on the interlink between art, community development, and integrated risk management. Ralph's battle cry for addressing climate change is collaboration. He has walked the talk with his participation in environmental empathy and innovation in collaboratoire. Thank you very much, Ralph, for this very interesting talk. Now, I would like to remind the audience to please reserve your questions for Ralph until the end of the fourth speaker's presentation. Please send your questions via UPOU Networks, chat room, YouTube comment box, and Facebook comment box. Now I would like to introduce our second speaker. Our second speaker is J. Bess Flores. Javis was my former student as he graduated from a Master of Environment and Natural Resources Management at UP Open University in 2016. He has recently finished the requirements for a PhD in Environmental Science at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, and will graduate in June. He has recently published a part of his dissertation, The Structure of Permaculture Landscapes in the Philippines in the journal Biodiversitas. and culture as it encompasses designs beyond agricultural applications. The word permanent back then was used in the way we use the word sustainable in today's context. Now that we have defined permaculture, let's try to reimagine agriculture by reflecting on these Instagram posts from Permaculture Research PH. In the first IG post, focusing on its economic and social values. On the second one, is my farm beneficial to the ecosystem? Since farms are man-made, we can pause and ask ourselves this question. What benefit can it bring to the planet other than providing people with food? And how can our farms help mitigate climate change? Can it sequester carbon? Can it improve air and water quality? Can it provide a habitat for wildlife and non-crop plant species? And for the last one, it says here, aerial photography helps us understand 
our farm's impact on the ecosystem. Since I use drones for research, it is very fascinating for me to observe how farms are able to affect the landscapes and ecosystems they are in. Now our actions are urgent. We only have nine years left to turn things around. And it is not just rural landscapes that we need to be concerned about, but also our urban landscapes. Urbanization is spreading like an uncontrollable disease on the planet's surface. Now, permaculture is a platform for immediate action. We can start with where we are right now with the things that we have at the moment. It's integrating all the things that we know and designing it to align with the patterns found in the natural world. We often don't hear about them, but there are many permaculture practitioners in the Philippines, each with their own unique landscapes, their own culture, their own experiences, and interpretation of what makes a sustainable design. Permaculture is a dynamic and evolving system of design, and it challenges people to understand and value their surroundings. In fact, permaculture has gained some attention last year as it was declared beneficial for our climate by the government. Here's a map of permaculture projects in the Philippines. It's an open map. You may add entries to it and check it out at bit.ly slash permamapph. For now, let's check out some of the sites we visited for our research in 2018. This is Aloha House in Palawan, a residential area and diversified organic urban farm based on an aquaponic system. It features an orphanage, bed and breakfast services, and natural farming training services. Alpas is a coastal private property in Antique. It has an access to a beachfront, accommodation and facility, and it has a restaurant service that specializes in local cuisine while advocating the use of local products. It features an herb and vegetable garden with fruit trees. This one is Kabyokid in Nueva Ecija. It is a diversified organic farm featuring rainwater catchment ponds for aquaculture and dry season irrigation. The farm is buffered by thick forest edges. Uh, that function as as a wildlife corridor and habitat. This one is the Eco House in Marikina, Metro Manila. It is a residential home made of clay cement mixture. It features a rainwater harvesting system, solar power system, and a home garden with a small fish pond. It is also the office of the Philippine Permaculture Association. This one is called Glenoga Organic Farm. It is also a diversified organic farm located within a mangrove ecosystem and rice coconut agroecosystem. It focuses on hyper-local food production and value-added products using natural farming techniques. This one, a house in Jubileeville in Laguna. Uh, there they grow perennial tree crops and it has a backyard garden irrigated by a swale system and a man-made rainwater catchment pond. Kai Farms in Cavite is an organic farm in, in, in Silang, Cavite, featuring multi-crop vegetables, herbs, and fruit trees. It uses plant-based compost and plant-based zero-waste packaging materials. Also, they advocate seed saving. Lorenza's Garden and Food Forest Farm in Isabella is an isolated, do-it-yourself homestead property. And during that time when we visited, it was still under construction. It has a vegetable and herb garden buffered by native trees around the perimeter. The, Just the Justice German Lee Jr. Nature Sanctuary or the Nature Sanctuary in Cebu is a mangrove and beach forest ecosystem featuring a complex system of meandering swales 
It features bamboo structures, a compost toilet system, and a variety of appropriate technologies. The Olausen Permaculture Park in Mountain Province is a diversified upland organic farm located on an ancestral property with indigenous Igorot origins called the Layog Country Farm. It, em it emphasizes foraging and preservation of indigenous culture through food and farming. Tara Farms is a residential farm resort set up with a rice production component organic herbs and vegetables, and free-range native pigs. And lastly, this is Umaleng Permaculture Farm in Zamboanga del Sur. It is a rice duck integrated farming system with aquaculture, organic herb and vegetable pocket gardens, a fruit orchard, and organic soap production facility. After seeing all of the examples, we, we may ask ourselves, uh, where do we begin? How do we apply permaculture in our daily lives? For now, I would have to say, you must get to know your landscape first. Look at maps, use Google Earth, and reflect on your place on the landscape. Then start with simple designs at home by observing how the natural world works. When it rains, where does the rainwater accumulate? Can we design a way to catch that and store it for later use? When you look at the tree in front of your house, do birds go there to rest and feed? Can we plant more trees to provide a habitat for them? Start simple and start small, but start now. The complexity of your design will grow as you gain experience and wisdom. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I'll gladly answer your questions later in our open forum portion of this webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jabez, for providing us with the various permaculture designs you have observed in various locations in the Philippines. Permaculture is equated with sustainable culture and goes beyond the concept of just growing food. It has important applications to biodiversity and ecosystem goods and services in the farms and the people who do the farming. Today, we can start with intuitive, simple, and appropriate permaculture designs suggested by JBES and continue on with the sustainable practice. Again, I would like to remind the audience to send your questions via UPOU Network's chat room YouTube comment box or Facebook comment box. Please reserve your questions after the fourth speaker's presentation. Now let us proceed to the third speaker. Marlon is the Chief Operations Officer of the Save the Ipogao Rice Terraces Movement, a nonprofit heritage conservation organization in Ipogao, Philippines. Ipogao is home to the Ipogao Rice Terraces of the Philippine Cordillera, a UNESCO declared World Heritage Site. He actively works with various academic and conservation organizations in the pursuit of indigenous studies, integration, and inclusion in the formal school curricula. Mr. Martin has co-authored several journal articles on indigenous knowledge systems and practices, the archeology span and the history of the Ifugao rice terraces, and also a book on the Ifugao ritual specialist or the Mumbaki. Marlon also established the first community-led Ifugao indigenous people's education center based in Kiangan. Marlon has been tirelessly working in involving the youth in the heritage conservation of the Ifugao rice terraces. Let us now listen and marvel at how the Ifugaos have been living in harmony with nature in their management of the famous rice terraces. Maybe we can learn a thing or two on how they have managed to address the climate problems in their community.
my designated topic is on indigenous knowledge and how uh, indigenous peoples have coped with climatic changes brought about by natural and man-made causes. We are not here to romanticize indigenous knowledge or indigenous peoples, but we have seen recent development in the fight against uh, climate change that indigenous peoples and their understanding of the natural environment can actually offer sustainable solutions to the problems besetting the planet today. In recent years, modern science has increasingly recognized the value of indigenous knowledge, especially in the issue of climate change and environmental protection. So UNESCO defines indigenous knowledge as that referring to the understanding, skills, and philosophies developed by societies with long histories of interaction with their natural surroundings. For rural and indigenous peoples, local knowledge informs decision-making about fundamental aspects of day-to-day -day life. So indigenous knowledge um, evolved through generations of trial and error, hundreds and even thousands of years of uh, experiencing the natural environment. I'd like to focus on three um, uh, major areas of indigenous knowledge, namely agriculture and food security, land use and environmental sustainability, and community values or customary law. These are basically what encompasses um, indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge is um, a manifestation of the interplay of people, culture, and their uh, natural environment. Indigenous peoples have shaped and reshaped their physical environment in harmony with the natural elements. This re reverence for the natural environment, the indigenous concept of being uh, stewards of the land, caretakers of the planet, is rooted in indigenous peoples' cultures. A Kalinga elder once said, such arrogance to say you own the land when in fact the land owns you, or how can you own that which outlives you? This was of course uttered in a different context, but the meaning holds true in the climate change discourse. Land is life, so is water and air. We are all just passing through, but with the responsibility of passing it down to the next generation, preferably in a better state than when it was passed down to us. A fine example of how indigenous peoples harmonize their activities in their natural environment is illustrated by this Ifigo agricultural uh, calendar. In ancient times, a calendar keeper keeps track of the changes in their natural environment and then informs the village of the beginning or the ending of a season, a particular work phase, or the performance of certain rituals. Weather indicators include the arrival of migratory birds, such as the killing, a flock of birds that arrive in November. This signals the start of the cold months and the time for rice seeds to be soaked in the paddies for germination. The performance of the first rice planting ritual also takes place during this time. This traditional calendar has four seasons divided into 12 months. Each season or month is designated by a natural phenomena as observed through the generations. Through a collective observation of natural um, occurrences, the Ifugao planned their existence in harmony with the rhythm of the sun, the moon, and the rain. The seedlings germinate and grow when there is abundance of sun and water. When work is done in the rice fields, men work the forest, selectively harvesting matured trees and gathering edibles during a short period prior to the season of rice harvest. During the season of harvest, forests and their wildlife are, are allowed to regenerate as the rice fields produce enough food for the village. This sustainable cycle of practical use of natural resources promotes ecological balance. Climate change is addressed by time-proven measures that ensure the survival of the village in case of extreme weather conditions that may damage main crops. Supplementary production areas are cultivated alongside major production areas such as rice, corn, or millet fields. Secondary domesticates, usually resistant to extreme weather conditions such as fruit crops and tubers are planted in Sweden farms. Agroforestry is also an indigenous practice, a source of food and livelihood, especially in hard times. Monocropping is rare, rarely an agricultural practice among indigenous communities. 
indigenous peoples have this vast knowledge and the interconnectedness of different life forms, flora and fauna, the interdependence of species, of humans, plants and animals. While biodiversity and ecological balance are words missing in most indigenous languages, the practice is a natural one and is a part of the way of life of most indigenous communities. Biodiversity to indigenous peoples is a verb rather than a noun. A fine example of indigenous knowledge in agriculture is the practice of rice terracing among highland indigenous peoples. Maximizing production in limited and hostile mountain conditions, indigenous peoples like the Ifugaos of the Philippine Cordilleras developed an intricate knowledge system that sustained their communities for hundreds of years without causing irreparable damage to their natural environment. In UNESCO's statement of uh, its outstanding universal value, it states, the maintenance of the living rice terraces reflects a primarily cooperative approach of the whole community, which is based on detailed knowledge of the rich diversity of biological resources existing in the Ifugao agroecosystem, a finely tuned annual system respecting lunar cycles, zoning and planning, extensive soil conservation and mastery of a most complex pest control regime based on the processing of a variety of herbs accompanied by religious rituals. The rice terraces are a dramatic testimony to a community's sustainable and primarily communal system of rice production based on harvesting water from the forest-clad mountain tops and creating stone terraces and ponds. The rice terraces are a memorial to the history and labor of hundreds of generations of small-scale farmers who, working together as a community, have created a landscape based on a delicate and sustainable use of natural resources. The rice terraces are an outstanding example of land use that resulted from a harmonious interaction between people and its environment which has produced a steep terrace landscape of great aesthetic beauty, now vulnerable to social and economic changes. Forests, as we know, are the lands of the planet, and most remaining forests are ancestral domains of indigenous peoples. Traditional communities practice forest management using knowledge passed down by their ancestors. Indigenous peoples in forest domains have a wide-ranging plant classification system, reflective of their vast knowledge and understanding of their uh, forest domains. Before the introduction of commercial logging, indigenous peoples practiced sustainable use of forest resources, taking only what they need through selective harvesting and regulated hunting and gathering. Each tree has a specific purpose which requires the continuity of each species. To indigenous peoples, the forest is a hardware store, a pharmacy and a grocery. You take what you need, but you have an obligation to pay something in return. Forests not only help in conserving water supply, trees also serve as a protection from low-lying villages from water runoff and landslides. While plant a tree is a generic climate slogan for most people, the nuanced knowledge of indigenous peoples would say the right tree at the right place at the right time. This is a sample land use of indigenous peoples in the Cordillera Mountains in northern Luzon. Here you can see how the natural environment is utilized by indigenous peoples using collective knowledge accumulated through generations. The way of life of indigenous peoples are inextricably linked to their ancestral lands, yet they are the most adversely affected by climate change, mainly because of their dependence on local biodiversity, ecosystem services, and cultural landscapes as a source of well-being and sustenance. This notwithstanding their low-carbon traditional way of life and least contribution to climate change. As we have been saying, traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples are born out of the experience of several generations. The mountains, rivers, and seas are sacred. The current generation has an obligation to take care of the land for the generations yet unborn. Indigenous knowledge to the interconnectedness of things and people are temporary stewards of the land. Taboos and beliefs of indigenous communities towards the treatment of forests, rivers, and other sacred spaces 
are built in regulations for the protection and conservation of the environment. Cultural and ecological rules are in place to prevent wanton destruction or overexploitation of limited natural resources. In conclusion, with the collective knowledge of the natural environment accumulated through generations, indigenous peoples are excellent observers and interpreters of change in the environment. Indigenous knowledge offers valuable insight that is critical for verifying climate models and evaluating climate change scenarios. Other than that, indigenous knowledge provides a crucial foundation for community-based adaptation and mitigation actions that sustain resilience at the local, regional, and global scales. Indigenous peoples inhabit areas at the social and ecological margins of human habitation, such as small islands, tropical forests, high altitude zones, coastal areas, and the circumpolar Arctic. Here in these margins, the impacts of climate change are most felt, yet the indigenous peoples have least to contribute to the man made causes of these climate upheavals. For this, Indigenous knowledge needs wider recognition and a stronger role in the global climate discourse. Thank you. Thanks, Marlon, for this enlightening talk about the holistic character of the indigenous knowledge systems and practices of the Ifugao. I would think you all heard the cock crow in his talk something that we folks in the urban landscape miss hearing. Indeed, we can learn a lot from the Ifugaos on using environmental signals in an agricultural calendar and rituals for the entire rice production. Ingenious ways of directing headwaters to irrigate their paddy fields, their practice of multiple and organic cropping even before it became in vogue, and selective cutting and harvesting of trees. They are experts at shaping and reshaping their steep built rice terraces while recognizing the fact that natural resources are limited and must be used wisely. This is attested by their low carbon lifestyles. They also recognize that they are temporary stewards of the land and must ensure that the concept of sustainable living in harmony with nature is passed on to the next generation. Thank you very much for that talk, Marlon. Now, I would like again to remind the audience to send your questions via UPOU Networks, the chat room, YouTube box, comment box, or Facebook comment box. Questions will be addressed after the fourth speaker's presentation. Now, let us listen to my introduction of the last, uh, the the last speaker, Professor Pat Palabrigo Jr. Professor Pat is better known for his three books on Philippine native trees. His book, Shades of Majesty, 88 Philippine Native Trees, won the best book in science during the 2013 National Book Awards. He is the Indiana Jones of Philippine trees, having literally visited and searched for the elusive and rare Philippine trees using taxonomic records of where they were originally found. All his stories are found in his second book, Binhi, Tree for the Future, which chronicles the scientifically backed search and rescue efforts of an energy corporation and its government and civic partners to save 96 native trees from disappearing in the Philippine forests, growing the wildings and seeds using technology that they continue to develop and planting the seedlings with the help of various social civic partners nationwide. He is a plant taxonomist, specializing mostly on trees, specializing mostly on trees, bamboos, mosses, and liverworts, and describing new species of plants from the forests of the Philippines. He is also a forestry professor at the University of the Philippines Los Banos College of Forestry, the chairperson of the Department of Forest Biological Sciences, and also the manager of the UPLB Land Grant Management Office. Professor Pat?
Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you all for attending this webinar. Let me first extend my deepest gratitude to the organizers, particularly to Dr. Connie Habito, for inviting me to be one of the speakers for this webinar. And thank you also, Ms. Rea Pascual, for patiently coordinating with me. Ms. Rea gave me a very challenging guide question for me to consider in making my presentation relevant to the theme, Solve Climate in 2030. And the question is this, in the context of planting native trees, what can we do this year to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced joblessness, sickness, and loss? I hope I'll be able to provide some reasonable answers to this very tough uh, question with my presentation. Okay, let's just start by stating that the basic scientific uh, development of climate change is essentially complete. There's no longer a debate on the truthfulness of climate change. Multiple studies published in peer-reviewed scientific journals show that more than 97% of actively publishing climate scientists agree that climate change is occurring. And rigorous scientific research demonstrates that the greenhouse gases emitted by human activities are the primary driver. Therefore, we have no choice but to respond on this. Responding to climate change involves two possible approaches. Mitigation, which involves reducing the flow of heat trapping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, either by reducing sources of these gases, for example, the burning of fossil fuels for electricity, heat or transport, or enhancing the sinks, the sinks that accumulates and store these gases, such as the oceans, forest, and soil. The goal of mitigation is to avoid significant human interference with the climate system and stabilize greenhouse gases levels in a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystem to adapt naturally to climate change, ensure that food production is not threatened, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. Adaptation, on the other hand, means adapting to life in a changing climate, which involves adjusting to actual or expected future climate. The goal is to reduce our vulnerability to the harmful effects of climate change, like sea level encroachment, more intense extreme weather events, or food insecurity. It also encompasses making the most of any potential beneficial opportunities associated with climate change. For example, longer growing seasons or increased yields in some regions. As, conclude, as concluded by the IPCC on their 2007 synthesis report on climate change, neither adaptation nor mitigation alone can avoid all climate change impacts. However, they can complement each other and together they can significantly reduce the risk of climate change. Another key findings of the IPCC synthesis report is that there is substantial potential for mitigation over the coming de decades that could reduce emissions below current level. And speaking of mitigation, it has been long recognized that managing forests is key to successful uh, mitigation of climate change. In the 2015 UNFCCC's 21st Conference of Parties, the World Wildlife Fund's Forest and Climate Program calls for the inclusion of forest and the land sector in the, in the Paris Agreement. They perceive that forest impact people in many ways that we can uh, imagine and their value in mitigating climate change cannot be underestimated. It has been widely recognized that forest management has the largest potential to mitigate impacts of climate change. IPCC uh, Working Group 3 report showed that in terms of proportion of total potential, forest management has the greatest potential as compared to afforestation and re reducing deforestation, particularly in Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, Region or OECD which is composed of Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. 
Forestry also has the greatest potential among the different land use types. And when it comes to total land use mitigation potential, the Asian countries has the highest mitigation potential. That is in comparison with OECD region, EIT or Economies, Economies in Transition region, composed of Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, MAF or the Middle East and Africa, and LAM composed of Latin America and Caribbean. Looking at the contribution of Philippine forests in mitigating climate change, the country's second national report or communication to the UNFCCC in 2014 showed that Philippine forests are significant sinks of carbon and attributed to 105,111 gigagrams or equivalent to 116 million tons of carbon, which is enough uh, to compensate 83% of the country's carbon emission. And that significant contribution is based on the already small forest cover we have in 2014. Take note that we have a very rapid forest decline of more than 50% during the 20th century. Imagine how much mitigation potential through carbon sequestration can large forest cover contribute. And this is why forest protection and management is becoming more and more important. But did our forest cover improve in the recent years, considering that we have the very extravagant national greening program? Here is a very recent publication by Perez et al on reforestation and deforestation in Northern Luzon. According to the authors who observed satellite data in the past two decades to assess the results of the government's massive reforestation program, deforestation in Northern Luzon has canceled out the gains of the national greening program. Analysis also showed that while forest loss declined from 2011 to 2015, it increased from 2016 to 2018 resulting in no significant gain from the NGP. Accordingly, there was a modest increase in forest loss in 2009 and 2010, followed by a decreasing trend that reached a record low in 2014 at only 553 hectares for closed forest and 1,246 hectares for open forest. This is interesting because the decline occurred concurrently with the NGP project initiation in 2011. It syndicates support to the project and public awareness towards the crucial need for reforestation. However, during the last year of the first phase of the NGP in 2016, the loss area increased suddenly to a relatively high level at 1,795 hectares for the closed forest and 3,862 hectares for the open forest and it was even higher in 2017 and 2018. Such an increase in the loss of tree cover during the 2016 to 2018 period is discouraging because it occurred at the end of the first phase and the beginning of the second phase of the national greening program. Quantitatively, it is also important to note that the rate of losses is higher for the closed forest, which is 893 hectares per year, done for the open forest, 388 hectares per year. This must be a big concern because the much valued close forest that is closely connected to the rich biodiversity of the region is being re reduced more indiscriminately than the open forest. Okay, responding to the uh, challenging guide question. In this pandemic times, what can we do to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced joblessness, sickness, and loss? At the global level, I think uh, the UNFCCC's member countries, especially the third world countries, should, lab should lobby for the immediate approval of the mechanism for the implementation of the Red Plus incentive, which started way back 2005. The reducing emission from deforestation and degradation, red or red plus mechanism, is supposed to be the great hope for saving the world's forest. Red plus is described as policy approaches to create 
financial incentives to the forest dependent communities, which are more prominent in the third world countries for keeping forests standing instead of chopping them down for timber, pulp and paper, cattle, palm oil, and rubber. At the same time, Red Plus could generate benefits for the rural poor while safeguarding biodiversity and other ecosystem services. Several studies on cost and carbon sequestration assessment, including carbon opportunity cost, suggest that the low cost, uh, low case forecast for carbon dioxide is $15 per ton for 2020, $25 per ton for 2030, and $45 per ton for 2050. And following the study of Alberts and Kanji in 2003, the typical carbon dioxide sequestration rates for tropical forests is around 200 tons per hectare per year. This will mean financial incentive of 150,000 per pesos per hectare per year, 250,000 per hectare per year, and 450,000 per hectare per year for 2020, 2030, and 2050, respectively. That's a lot of money for the forest communities, but just a small amount from the rich people of the first world countries. There was already a suggested mechanism on how to generate funds and divulge it from the international fund to the national level, then down to the community or the subnational level. However, until now, the parties haven't reached a compromise yet, primarily because there are vocal groups in the UNFCCC process that simply do not like the international carbon market. Many experts believe that uh, for Red Plus to work, there has to be an absolute commitment to the transparency of the policy process of national Red Plus programs and of finance. Otherwise, there will be continued distrust of Red Plus and its market orientation. Most forest dependent communities when presented with the full range of potential risks and benefits associated with Red Plus are very keen to explore financial payments to maintain their forest. But the big question is, when will this be realized? At the national level, our government should put the same prioritization to forest protection in the same way that NGP has been and is still being treated as the greatest hope of the Philippine forest. We are very thankful that our government is pouring billions of pesos to NGP, which started in 2011. But isn't it ironic that while we are spending a lot of money to bring back the gun forest, we are at the same time allowing illegal poachers, charcoal makers, and caingineros to take down our existing forest resources. This is a typical example of what is happening on the ground. In 2007, the UP Mountaineers, some of them are my, uh, are my friends, uh, adapted a portion of the new dead forest in Ipo watershed. They reforested it using pioneer species and they brought it back to green. But in 2014, the same reforestation area was again burned and cut down. I believe everybody uh, understands that even if we are doing reforestation to upset the trees that have been cut before, what we have lost previously may not really be recovered anymore, especially if we deal with old growth forest containing century old trees and endemic trees. We cannot just replace them with new siblings. On the positive note, the enhanced national greening program issued as executive order 193 in 2015, which extended NGP until 2028, timely for 2030, already exclude Oh, sorry, already include maintenance and protection of existing forest. Aside from environmental restoration, one of the goals of NGP is poverty eradication. In fact, it's listed number one in the EO 23 and 26 to contribute in reducing poverty among upland and lowland poor households, indigenous peoples, and in coastal and urban areas. I believe NGP has the capacity to do both if NGP will be community-based instead of the usual bidding process, which is very prone to corruption. Then it will provide alternative livelihood 
to the upland communities, which should result to less pressure to the forest. Some plant conservation advocates believe that if there's one good thing this pandemic has brought us, it's the unprecedented increase in the appreciation of the beauty and importance of plants to people. Many plantitos and plantitas embrace the fact that plants don't just look good, they make people feel good too. Especially that most people are already or already suffered and still suffering from quarantine fatigue. However, with the proliferation of plantitos and plantis, plantitas all over the country, plant poachers have never been an, as active as before, which results from over collection, leaving the forest under study, understory heavily damaged. This plant craze and plant plant demic should be seen by the forest regulators as an opportunity for the legitimate plant collectors, collectors to earn a living. The government can capacitate and train the forest dependent communities on proper collection, mass propagation, and nursery care to ensure sustainable supply of the highly in demand ornamental plants. As you know, many people are getting crazy about about native plants with high ornamental potentials. This is a good opportunity to introduce to the market our native plant species with great ornamental value while providing livelihood to the legitimate growers. Okay, so while I, while I understand that these strategies I enumerated would not create enough job for the more than 3.2 million Filipinos who got jobless during this pandemic. I'm pretty sure that prioritizing forest protection and biodiversity conservation will benefit not just the Filipinos, but other countries as well. Because it is in the forest where we will rely for our basic needs. And more than ever, it is during these pandemic times that many people are most dependent to the health of the forest. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Pat, for your talk on the large potential of forests in mitigating climate change impacts. Indeed, Philippine forests are important carbon sinks. But it is disheartening to note that poor, the poor performance of the National Greening Program in reforestation and that most of the significant losses in forest cover are in the closed forests. But we cannot just be fence sitters. Professor Pat mentioned four actions and I call them L-A-R-E. L stands for lobby for REDD plus or red incentive to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. A, allocate budget for forestry planting, maintenance and protection. R, reforest areas as a collective. And E, encourage small forest-based industries. This is a call for a more strong advocacy and action at various scales. Thank you very much, Professor Pat, for your talk. I will now open the floor for questions from our audience. Please post your questions via UPOU Network's chat room, YouTube comment box, or Facebook comment box. Now let us look at the first question. Okay, so the first question is from Jonathan Catalia, and it is directed at uh, Jay Bess. How can we promote permaculture in urban and suburban environments? Hi, yes. Tinig niyo po ako? Yes po. Okay. Well, actually, applicable siya at any scale in any environment. So ito nag-change ako ng aking ano, background photo. Um, ito yung aking uh, garden. So, nasa suburban area kami. Um, Nag-start lang kami totally blank. Wala talagang nakatanim dyan uh, three years ago. And now, productive na siya on all levels. So, meron na kaming ground cover at trees na nag-grow uh, dyan. So, it doesn't matter yung space or kung nasaan ka. So, ang thought process dito, ang design process behind this was... Um, 
wala akong matanim, wala akong seeds, wala din akong seedlings. Pero meron akong uh, cuttings ng kamote tops. So ang naging problem ko dito ay um, pag umuulan, nagpuputek. So sabi ko, pag nagtanim ako dito ng kamote, pag nagpaglumago to, hindi na siya magpuputek. So doon muna nag-start. Yun yung aking simple question. And common problem to sa mga gustong mag-start ma- ng permaculture design kasi gusto nila ano agad. Um, complex agad yung design. Tapos gusto nila agad na very elaborate. Pero one principle of permaculture design is um, small and slow solutions. So nag-identify muna ako ng one problem. So nag-grow ako ng kamote, hindi nga as food source eh. Pero para mag-stop yung pagpuputek. So from there, na-cover yung aking buong uh, front yard ng kamote. So that's one example. Another more recent example is after nung Taal Volcano Eruption, nasira nung ash yung aming mga alulod. So pag umuulan, nasisira yung mga tanim ko. So dahil wala pa kaming budget para paayos yung alulod namin, uh, nag-isip ako ng plant na pag lumaki, pwede niyang i-divert yung, pag, ano, yung, yung impact ng rainfall. So nagtanim ako ng, ano, ng, kita ba dito, ng gabi. Diyan, ayan, ng gabi. So pag umuulan, nade-deflect niya yung, yung drops ng, ng rain away dun sa, sa mga tanim ko. So at the same time, natatakpan niya yung bintana namin. So para na rin siyang living fence. So ito yung mga small e- examples na you really have to observe. No? Observe um, ano yung nangyayari sa uh, kapaligaran mo. Kung sunlight lang yung meron kayo dun sa setting nyo, observe nyo kung saan tumatama yung sunlight at certain times. Ako naman ang isang motivation ko rin for planting and planting is habang nagpa-plant ako, dumadami yung birds dito. So we've identified already 10 species of birds na dito kumakain at tumatambay. So nag enjoy ako doon. So yun ang isang kong uh, motivator. So thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you very much, Jabez. Okay. Uh, the second question is directed to Professor Pat. So the question is this one. Carbon sequ- sequestration by tree planting in the forest may be too little too late according to some studies. In contrast, what do you think of disaster risk reduction by mangrove planting in vulnerable coastal areas? Is this ecologically sound? Okay, yeah. Uh, that's a very interesting question. No? Uh, first, on the question of the uh, is tree planting really uh, too little, too late for uh, at this time. So maybe that those studies uh, probably uh, were or this conclusion were made due to the recognition of the of the urgency for us to address the climate change now. No? But uh, as we always say, the best years to plant tree is 50 years ago, and the second best time is now. Even very little, the planting of tree today could still uh, contribute to the mitigation of uh, of climate change, no? And probably we will be will not be the one to enjoy the or uh, to benefit from those. But of course, our future generation, no. Uh, and that is why we are advocating not just for planting, but for the protection of the forest because it's already there. Uh, it's a uh, uh, it's really functioning and providing the ecosystem service. We says we need now, okay. And on the second uh, suggestion, that is uh, mangrove, or what do you think of the disaster re- uh, reduction by mangrove planting in vulnerable coastal areas? Mangrove planting is probably one of mangrove forest is one of the forests with the greatest potential to mitigate uh, or to sequester carbon. In fact, in many studies, carbon. Uh, sequestration of mangrove forest per hectare is even twice uh, higher than those in terrestrial forests because uh, basically of the sedimentation or uh, sedimentation stack or carbon sedimentation stack. But the problem with our, with many of our mangrove planting now is that they are uh, stubbies or they, they were planted, mangroves were planted in non-mangrove areas, particularly the, the seagrass beds. No? So we do not 
uh, want to alter the natural ecology of the forest. Mangrove is for forest, or is for mangrove forest, and seagrass is for seagrass beds. And uh, take note, we should always remember uh, the term, uh, the basic definition of the term reforestation, meaning it's th that area you should be, you should uh, plant mangrove should be mangrove po forest before. So you should not plant mangrove trees in non-mangrove areas, just like the seagrass beds. I think, uh, I hope I, can, I, I do answer the question. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Prof. Pat. Okay, the next question is directed at uh, Ralph. Is collaborative digital art, specifically online, also a good avenue to help solve climate? Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Sige. Yes, po, actually, um, I think um, especially because of the pandemic, um, a lot of things cannot be physical, no, in collaborative nature, no, physical. So um, digital works will really help as well, especially that um, um, communication uh, right now is uh, happening online as well. And I think there's, uh, I'll just like to echo what uh, Dr. Naval from UP Padayan said, no? which is also what um, uh, Anthony Leiservitz said, uh, the climate change communication. One of the problems of climate change is that um, it's sometimes it's difficult to see the effects because it's in the maybe future or near future. At the same time, CO2 is invisible, so we don't directly see it. That's why I think um, art is really a good way to, uh, you know, visualize this or make this um, um, perceivable to people. So uh, physical art, digital art uh, are, are good ways um, to communicate climate change and these issues and how to visualize these problems that's already happening and also will happen in the future. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph. Okay, we have another question from Chris Salinas. How can we share and propagate more about indigenous knowledge and philosophy with regards to climate change solutions. Uh, since um, Marlon cannot join us because of internet connection problems, I will we will direct your question to him and uh, you will get your answer. Okay. The other one has something to do with uh, what are the actions or plans in order to lessen or solve climate change as it has a devastating effect in our oceans. So anybody from uh, the four speakers or the three speakers can please answer this one. Uh, Professor Pat, can you answer this one? What are the actions or plans in order to lessen or solve climate change as it has a devastating effect in our oceans? Yeah, uh, okay. In my in my talk, uh, I already uh, enumerated some strategies, but uh, uh, probably it's in the forest, but we know uh, the interconnectivity of the forest and the ocean. So while uh, when you preserve your upland uh, ecosystem, then you are also uh, very much uh, doing good also to the uh, marine environment. You know? uh, Sorry, I don't have much research on the uh, ocean climate, no? but I think yeah, this, uh, this is interconnected. No? The, we should have a landscape approach always in our management planning. There's another uh, question here. It's actually directed at uh, Marlon, but I think I can answer this one. Uh, it has something to do with uh, indigenous knowledge for uh, coastals, for seas and oceans. Are we also looking at coastal indigenous knowledge that addresses the effects of climate change in our seas and oceans? Okay, for now, I, I can think of two uh, indigenous groups that are 
are into this one. One would be the Tagbanua tribe in uh, Palawan. So they have this great uh, respect for the for their seas for the, their coastal areas, and they also have, if the Ifugaos have their ancestral lands, the Tagbanwas also have their ancestral seas. Okay. The other group would be uh, in the Batanis group of islands up north. Okay. So they also have their respect for the seas and the oceans, and I think the there is a film that I watched. It was made in Japan, but uh, it documented the traditions of the fishermen of the Batanis group of islands and showing how they respect the, the oceans and the seas around them and also how they uh, do sustainable fishing. So I think that's the answer to the question, I hope. Okay. So uh, last question and this is directed to uh, Professor Pat does the government or DNR in particular I, in particular realize that the NGP could also cause a big problem to natural forests considering that many beneficiaries or farmers in the upland just converted natural forests into falcata plantation as the major commodities under NGP okay uh, I think the DNR already has a lot of uh... Uh, strategies no, to mitigate oh, this problem or uh, to uh, proliferate this problem because uh, the first thing that we should know in planting, be it in uh, oh, particularly in protected areas, is that uh, we should only plant native trees in protected areas. No? And therefore, uh, the best way to, to implement this is to have proper zoning. So for instance, we should have protection for protection forest and then production forest. For production forest, particularly if it's outside of the protected area, I think there is no problem with uh, planting the uh, exotic trees. Okay, but we must be very strict that in protected areas, there must be no planting of non-native species. You know, we have a big problem now for bioinvasion. No? We have a lot of bioinvasive species now proliferating inside many of our forests, many of our protected areas. But I think the DNR already have a lot of safeguards on that. They, they first conduct a, a recognize and survey mapping, planning before they declare an area to be a planting area for NGP. Thank you very much, Prof. Pat. Okay, this next question is directed to uh, Jebes. Pwede po i-count ang pag-establish ng bee farms near forests as permaculture po? Yes, actually, meron kami isang study site sa Quezon. Ang um, meron sila dong uh, native uh, bees, stingless bees. So yun ang nagiging source nila ng honey. So hindi siya yung naging ano talaga um, emphasis ng study namin kasi nag-focus kami on plant species. Pero mukhang successful naman yung kanilang pag-establish ng kanilang maliit na bee farm. At yung isang interesting doon ay yung material na ginagamit nila for beehives. Dahil ano siya, coconut plantation ang nagiging beehive ng mga stingless bees ay yung mga yung mga bao, yung mga coconut. So, tas strategically placed yung mga hives all over the area, malapit sa slopes kung saan nakatanim yung mga coconuts. So, pag nahulog yung mga ano, yung yung mga yung mga coconut, yung mga bao, iniiwan lang nila doon tapos nakita nila na pinapopulate ng mga bees. So yun yung naging design nila, part of their observation nila na may relationship yung kanilang mga stingless bees and yung kanilang coconuts. So yun, ganun. Pwede siya. Hindi lang limited sa plants ang, ang permaculture. Buong ecosystem siya. Up to bodies of water, pwede kayo mag-design. Okay. Thank you very much, Pat. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, Jebes. Okay, the next question is directed at to Ralph Lumbres, good morning. At present situation, how do you overcome the struggle in promoting the EEC? Are there any LGUs or NGOs supporting our environmental artists? Um, 
right now i i couldn't uh think of a specific program po, no? although um i would say na there are grants naman from the let's say ncca for artists in general so it doesn't really uh it's not specific for um how do you say um climate change or the environment sometimes maybe there's like thematic uh, programs and also like for this ex for example uh, of this is uh uh universities uh, which is part of uh you know the government uh, up open ou so by inviting me here is already part of that um but um so there are some i think there should be more um more programs more grants for artists who does these things um internationally uh there are also some um actually what i want to reiterate is that um there are ways for artists actually to tap the resources for the community projects or grant that are not specifically for the arts but for inter uh, interdisciplinary collaboration so i think don 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 pwedeng pumasok no yung um artists not just uh, from the government side or the institutions to make these um programs although that's of course that's needed artists then need to go into uh yung more interdisciplinary um collaborations um struggles when it comes to struggle in promoting uh yung project namin EEC, i think it's too early to to tell no although i would say that um the pandemic has shifted uh yung uh how do you say yung method namin before we wanted to do uh field works do some research but now it it could be online which i think is also good so that we can see another way to do these things um but yung struggle i think is maybe the shift but i i don't think it's like negative maybe it's just reframing and looking at different perspectives of doing things so and it's too early so maybe in the coming um uh, months uh we we could uh mas makikita pa namin yung um challenges dun sa research thank you okay Thank you very much, Ralph. Okay, uh, Prof. Pat, this, the next question is for you. Uh, I would like to ask how we can promote and encourage communities to plant more trees and how can we inform them about the impacts of deforestation and climate change in a way that they can easily understand it. I would agree that the political will can play a huge role in effectively enforcing these policies. I've had previous experience where in communities have difficulty grasping the reality regarding the effects of climate change and deforestation until it's too late. Yes, uh, very relevant question. In fact, uh, we consider community participation as the key to the success of any biodiversity conservation or forest protection strategies. No? So yeah, that's uh, a common problem that uh, uh, many communities uh, are not really that uh, active in participating. But uh, now we have a lot of advocacy groups. They are very good in uh, producing laymanized awareness campaign, IEC materials. No? Uh, if you know Philippine Biodiversity Parks, Philippine Native Tree Enthusiasts, na napakarami ng uh, nag-branch out na. No? Uh, and then, yeah, uh, even... Ko uh, private companies, no? Energy Development Corporation is very good in community organizing. So we just need to uh, to have some easily understandable IEC. But, but the basic thing is, of course, we need to uh, to live with them. We need to explain to them the importance of planting, of maintaining their native trees uh, as compared to planting exotic trees. No? And yeah, I agree that political will plays a significant uh, role in this conservation efforts. No? Uh, fortunately, there are now a lot of uh, politicians, not even politicians, even not, uh, even, ma even uh, businessmen who are very passionate, very concerned now in preserving, in conserving 
the native trees uh, in the country. No? But even though if it, if in our place there is no political will for our leaders, we, must, we should not be discouraged by that. No? Again, uh, we could have our base from the, on the ground. So we can go to the community, we can uh, do our, in our own ways, uh, in our backyards, no? and a lot of ad advocacy works. You can join a lot of advocacy groups no? uh, for this uh, endeavor. And uh, I am very uh, glad that at these times, more than ever, the appreciation to native trees is really unprecedented. We, many people are now, uh, more and more people are now becoming more and more interested and passionate in caring for the native plants, not only trees. Okay, uh, there's another question for Prof. Pat. Please comment po on plants being sneaked out of the forest to be sold commercially to plantitos and plantitas. Uh, yeah, of course that is illegal because we have uh, Republic Act 9147. Uh, but uh, again, during my talk, I, I said that we, we should treat this as an opportunity for our uh, legitimate, legitimate uh, collectors, legitimate growers no? uh, to, to earn and for our native species as well to be uh, introduced to the public. Uh, of, Again, we must we must train. We must uh, facilitate the capacity building of legitimate legitimate uh, growers, legitimate nursery uh, caretakers. We must have a le legal supplier of these plants you know, because again, the people are getting crazy. Go uh, having uh, these native ornamental plants in particular. And therefore, to be able to lessen the pressure to the natural forest, we must have a sustainable or mass propagation of this species as the sustainable source, legal source of these planting materials. Okay, another question, Prof. Pat. Uh, what are the best plants uh, that we should plant on the seashore? Makatabing oh. dagat. Yeah, of course, all the beach species. No? Uh, Ma'am Jujin Primavera has a good book on beach forests and beach plants of the Philippines. So you can look at that no? and you will be surprised. There's a lot of beach species with very nice or very high potential as ornamental plants. Spani, bitaog, huh? alubago. No? So there's a lot. So you can, the good thing now is that we have a lot of literature with regards to native trees. Huh? So uh, we have books on mangroves, books on beach forests, Philippine native trees 101, 203, 303, uh, our books with EDC, with Aboitis. So we now have a lot of, uh, of references if we really are interested to plant or to, uh, uh, to study our native trees. Okay, another question, Prof. Pat, talagang very popular ka. Ah, well, actually, not directed only to Prof. Pat, but to everyone. Uh, how much do you think uh, will employing these solutions in solving climate change in the Philippines affect the total climate endeavor worldwide? Um, sige po, I, I just like to reiterate uh, yung sinabi ko sa talk, yung first part, no, which is um, mindsets are... Uh, worldviews paradigms are very important in changing systems. Um, for example, let's say when Adam Smith uh, ano tawag nito? thought about a capitalist system or Marx about the um, uh, communist system, no? Marxist system, nagbago yung buong mundo just by these um, uh, ideas or mindsets na um, ina-introduce. No? Of course, hindi agad agaran. But it, what it means is that um, when you target behaviors through through these mindsets, through these paradigms, susunod na yung system. So when we talk about it, when we communicate about it, and do actions about it, 
um, it's very possible to to um, to solve this 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 problem. No? So, that on my part, that's my um, my view. So, yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, please. Oh, see Jabez Muna. Yes. Um, when asked uh, about that uh, question, may naisip ang analogy eh, on how individual action can actually impact the environment and hence climate change. When we polluted the earth, it didn't take much um, coordination to pollute the planet. No? So it's just individual action piling up and behaviors and attitudes that encourage the generation of waste and pollution. So when we were polluting the planet, we, we were not thinking of how would I pollute the entire planet, diba? Right? So it, you were just thinking about disposing or discarding your waste. And actually, yung impact nun, collectively, everyone thinking the same thing. Nag-pile up siya and then we ended up like this. Same thing, if we do it in reverse, if we do our own... Um, initiatives, our own strategies then, in improving the health of this planet, I think the impact will also be the same. So if we can destroy something, we can also create. So I, we're, we're on the regeneration part. We're on the creating part. Na. So if humans have the ability to destroy, we also have the ability to heal and create. Prof. Pat? Yeah, okay. Uh, to add... Uh on what Jabez said. Uh, so I think the solutions or the strategies that we suggested are generic in nature. And uh, again, if it would be uh, implemented globally, then that would have a really a great impact worldwide. But uh, uh, if we will employ these solutions uh, in the Philippines, no? so primarily we will be contributing to uh, to the uh, local climate of the, of, uh, of the country, but uh, we should not be discouraged if other countries are not doing this. No? So uh, we should we should just do what is what is right to do no? for the country. So even if others are not doing this, then we should do this in our country. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for that, Pat. Actually, in one in one lecture by uh, C.P. David, he said that uh, the Philippines contributes less than one percent to uh, carbon emissions worldwide. So, ang, ta ang mga top producers talaga ay uh, U.S., China, yung mga mga first world countries. But that doesn't uh, what do you call this? Uh, that that does not take away the responsibility of doing something to to help uh, solve climate change uh, impacts. So yeah. Yes, yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd like to add din po, no? So um, maybe some of you know na yung Bhutan is uh, negative pa yung carbon emission nila kasi nagsisequester pa sila. So ibig sabihin, we're also championing these nations na kahit maliit lang din silang country, um, in a way nagiging hero sila for climate change. No? So ganun din, if, if we do it, Parang, kumbaga, let's say, mahiya naman kayo US, mahiya naman kayo China, parang laki-laki nyo, etc. So, may, syempre may ganong effect din na kung gawin mo sa bansa mo, tapos tayo pa yung vulnerable kasi sea level rise, tapos um, disaster madami sa atin. So, I guess meron din ganong factor um, in terms of global um, viewpoints no, or ganun. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Jabez, another question. I live in the city po and we do not have land space. Is it possible for me to start permaculture without an actual empty space of land? Uh, yes po, thanks for the question. Uh, remind ko lang din yung audience na permaculture is not limited to agricultural applications. Actually, it's a design philosophy na pwede mong i-apply sa kahit, kahit saan. Sa paglinis ng kwarto mo, sa pag-ayos ng organization nyo or whatever. Pero ang common na uh, answer na sinasabi ko sa mga ganyang questions sa urban setting is um, identify nyo man objective nyo why will you start a permaculture design. So if it is not food growing or food production, there must be something else. So one thing that you can do in the city is harvesting rainwater. So 
actually I, I I find it puzzling kung bakit hindi equipped ang mga buildings natin with rainwater catchment. Kami naka rainwater catchment kami dito and it really proves very useful kasi laging nawawalan ng tubig dito. So, rainwater collection not for drinking, pang flush ng CR niyo, pang linis ng garahe niyo, pang dilig. Marami siyang applications. And once na na-set up niyo yung rainwater catchment niyo, makikita niyo na hindi siya mauubos kasi lagi siyang nare-refill ng ulan. And gagamitin niyo lang din siya pag kailangan niyo. So that's one direct uh, application. And it doesn't have to be very elaborate. May nakita kaming mga rainwater catchment systems na ano lang, literal na balde lang sa ilalim ng bubong. So it doesn't have to be really elaborate na naka 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 recta yung catchment niyo dun sa alulod niyo it could be very simple and you can start with that with collecting rainwater and it will have a lot of impact in our water supply okay uh, thank you very much i think uh, we will wrap up the question and answer portion as we are already on overtime so can i now uh, read the Certificate of Appreciation Citation for our four speakers for today. Uh, I will re now read the Certificate Citation. The University of the Philippines Open University Faculty of Management and Development Study presents this Certificate of Appreciation to the following speakers for today. Uh, Ralph Daniel Dubres, J. Best Joshua Flores, Marlon Martin, and Pastor Malabriga Jr. as panelists during the Solve Climate by 2030 webinar entitled Climate Solutions, the Philippine Context, held on 7 April 2021, live streamed by a UPOU Networks, given the 7th day of April at the University of the Philippines Open University, signed Primo G. Garcia Dean. Okay, I would like to remind the audience to answer the evaluation form to receive their e-certificate. We only have six hours to uh, do this one. Okay, the QR code or link to the evaluation form will be flashed on the screen. The evaluation form will be available, uh, six hours ba nakalagay dito, 12 hours. So 12 hours after the webinar. Please check the entries that they ha you have inputted in the evaluation form, especially your name, as it will be reflected in your e-certificate. Okay, to wrap up everything, I would just say that climate change is here and now, and its impact is felt all around the world. Marlon Martin has emphasized that more than any other community, it is the indigenous peoples living in the social and ecological margins of human habitation that bear the brunt of the impacts of climate change. He calls for a wider recognition and stronger role of indigenous knowledge systems and practice in the climate change discourse. Jabez, on the other hand, has documented permaculture as a way of life and a sustainable land management that can mitigate the impacts of climate change. Collectively, as discussed by Professor Pat, forests are the key to a successful Paris Agreement and has the largest climate change mitigation potential. Finally, according to Ralph, art can tug at our heartstrings and can be used to connect individuals and build resilient communities that can work towards climate change adaptation and mitigation. Now I challenge you to do your bit. While you can as an individual continue to use LED bulbs at home, consume less and bike to work, you can also join collective action to reduce the impacts of climate change. We only have nine years until 2030. Your attendance to this webinar is already a significant and important step toward that direction. As mentioned by Dr. Evan Goodstein, we have the tools, networks, and technologies as climate solutions. We can rewire for clean energy, reimagine global food systems, reinvent transportation, and regenerate forests, grasslands, oceans, and rivers as well. 
Again, I would like to remind the audience about the certificate. The link and QR code will now be shown on screen. Okay, the evaluation site shall be accessible after the webinar has ended and shall be open for only 12 hours. Certificates shall be issued within three days. Now I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Dr. Joanne Serrano. Thank you, Doc Connie, and thank you to our speakers, Ralph, Jabez, uh, Marlon, and Prof. Pat. Now, we are nearing the end of this webinar, and at this point, I want uh, to invite everyone to take on the challenge uh, posed by Doc Connie um, by making your own pledge on how you can help address this climate change. Um, now, posted in this uh, program, may I call on our Dean, Dr. Primo Garcia, to give the closing remarks. Before we close our event, I would like to express my gratitude to the Bard Center of Environmental Policy in New York, especially Dr. Eben Goodstein and Dr. David Goodstein, for initiating a much-needed global dialogue on climate solutions. Thank you for your passionate care for the environment, for a sustainable future, and for believing in the capacity of our students and educators in finding solutions to the climate crisis. I would also like to thank Dr. John Serrano and Dr. Consuelo Habito for spearheading a localized webinar through the UP Open University. And of course, to our panelists, Dr. or Mr. Ralph Lumbres, Mr. Jabez Flores, Mr. Marlon Martin and Professor Pastor Malabrigo Jr. Thank you for sharing how your various fields of expertise can help respond to climate problems in the Philippines and in the world. Climate crisis is indeed a cause for concern for us. The Philippines has constantly been vulnerable to its effects because of our geography or location, but also because we are a developing country. The poor suffer the most. As we have learned today, we don't have to be environmentalists to help solve the climate crisis. We just simply have to care. No matter what background climate change is relevant, whether we're in the arts, in literature, mathematics, science, or any other field, we can all do something about it. The webinar has ended, but the dialogue doesn't have to. Educators, what a great honor we have been given to mentor the future generation. Let us use this privilege wisely. Set an hour of discussion in your classrooms about the climate crisis. We never know how a simple discussion can impact even just one student and spark further conversations within families and friends. Students, you are the countries and the world's future leaders. You are never too young to make a difference. Be courageous. Ask your teachers to make climate a class. Again, thank you to everyone who participated. We hope you can continue to join us in this vision to solve climate by 2030 so we don't have to lose our world to climate change forever. <laughs>